Hi everybody and welcome to another video. My name is Richard Seidlitz. I'm the owner of redpants.lol. Behind me is my 2007 Aston Martin V8 Vantage, which you probably haven't seen in a while because it's been either in storage or in various states of disassembly because either I've been out of town or out of the state or out of the country, or it's waiting on parts or we're developing something new or we're changing plans. So it's been a while since this has been around because it's just, there's a lot going on. Let's put it very simply. And that's just the work side of stuff, let alone all the personal crap that I'm dealing with in my life, which I'm sure I'll talk about eventually on Red Pants Unzipped. But for now, let's talk about this. Uh, this car is at British Italian German Motors, which is where I'm at right now. They gave me this nice little private garage area to work in. Um, if you aren't aware, I've been living out of a suitcase for a year, which is part of that whole personal conversation on Red Pants Unzipped. Uh, so I don't have any of my tools, but locally, uh, my, luckily my local shop, British Italian German Motors, uh, has been taking care of me to help me out with all the stuff I need to do and allow me to sort of film on the side of uh, the rest of the shop. So big thank you to them if you're in the Boise area or want to send your car or come visit. They're a great shop and I really appreciate all the help they've done uh, for me for this. So. Um, while this car has been going through a lot of work, I realize that there's a lot of stuff that has to do with reliability that is worth talking about. Uh, my car is uh, almost 15 years old and has almost 100,000 miles on it. So there's a lot of age and reliability related things that we can discuss, especially since a lot of these cars are starting to get up there in age and mileage. Something that I get asked about very often from people that are either owners of the cars and starting to worry about the future or wonder about the future uh, and prospective buyers that are interested in buying into these cars but don't know what to expect and they want some insights. So I figured this would be a good time to make a video talking about reliability related issues. This might end up being a little bit long so if you need a drink grab it now and then we'll get started. off a little bit of housekeeping for this video. Uh, this video is going to be about reliability issues. Reliability issues, not maintenance or maintenance related issues. So if you have electrical gremlins caused by an old battery, well that's neglect because the battery needs to be replaced, that's maintenance. That's not a reliability issue. Uh, we're also not going to talk about anything that comes down to design. So brake squeal is not a reliability issue. That's how the brake pads are designed. It's a, it's a result of their design. Um, so we're not going to talk about things like that. Uh, the thermostat, for example, those fail every five to seven years from what I've seen. That's a maintenance thing as far as I'm concerned. When you change your coolant every five years, change your thermostat, that's more of a maintenance thing. But I just mentioned it, so check mark on that one if you think that it is reliability related. Um, beyond that, we're not going to talk about damage that I or somebody else or some jerk off tire wall caused to my car. Uh, that's damage from myself or somebody else or the jerk off tire wall, not reliability. So I'm sure each of those things will be mentioned at least a little bit in passing or referenced, but this video is not about them. It's about maintenance. Excuse me. <laughs> I almost messed it up already. This has been a long day. Uh, we're talking about reliability, not maintenance, not damage. I figured we'd start this video off by looking at the cabin of the car because that's where my first ever problem came up with my 2007 Aston Martin. Probably about a year or so after I bought it, the nav gears in my car stopped working. So the nav gears, uh, as I've mentioned in numerous videos and articles and everything else, are the gears that basically move the screen up. There's a motor, there's a little electric motor and some gears, and that's what opens and closes the navigation screen. Uh, it's not uncommon for those to go bad. If you need to replace them, it's not difficult. Um, but that was the first thing that I had go wrong with this car. I took it to the local dealership when I was living in Georgia at the time. They fixed it. I think they charged me an hour of labor and the cost of the gears, both of which were very reasonable. Uh, so that was a pretty dumb deal. The Bluetooth switcher kit in this car did go bad. Uh, very easy to figure that out because one side of speakers started going uh, in and out and when that happens when you know one side of speakers is out you can sort of stomp on the passenger side footrest uh, that that floorboard where the footrest is if you stomp on that and the sound fixes itself it's because you're shocking the bluetooth system the bluetooth switcher kit and it's reconnecting those speakers so um it's easy to fix but that's one thing the design of the bluetooth switcher kit did change at some point i want to say an 0809 but i could be wrong about that so so make sure you see, you check to make sure exactly what you have before you start ordering parts if you have that problem. 
my passenger door module has been sort of on, I won't say it's been on the fritz, it's not a common thing, but every once in a while, either the door lo won't lock or unlock properly, or the window won't respond at all. So that's a door module problem. Uh, it's easy to do a temporary fix, which is to pull a fuse. So fuses, I think 82 and 83 off the top of my head are the fuses for the passenger and driver's side, the left and right doors. So you can just pull those out for a few seconds, put them back in, resets the door module, and it usually is a temporary fix. Uh, if it continues or it gets bad enough or the fuses don't work, you'll have to replace the door modules. You'll want to replace the door modules in pairs. I haven't done it yet because that hasn't been that much of an issue and usually I drive around alone because I'm lonely. So the passenger window, and, or excuse me, the passenger door as a whole just kind of doesn't really become an issue for me, but it is something I'll have to do eventually. One day I was driving along and something hit me on the top of the head. Turns out it was my headliner falling out. Uh, it didn't fall out completely, it was just enough to sag down to rest on the top of my head. Now I'm not terribly surprised by this, uh, again the age and, and whatnot, but also I almost always have my windows at least cracked if not all the way down when I drive. Yeah, unless it's raining or snowing or extraordinarily cold, I almost always have the windows cracked or all the way down and that leads to a lot of wind buffeting inside the cabin. Uh, that and I lived in Florida for a while, which gets extremely hot. That's going to loosen up some of the adhesives. It's going to help just sort of make that happen a little bit quicker. So I do have to fix the headliner. I'll be making a video about that soon. The second issue I ever had was my fuel vapor recirculation hose. Every once in a while, while coasting, uh, usually in neutral, the car would shut off. It would, the engine would stall, the car would shut off, and I'd be just coasting along, no power brakes, no steering. It's actually really scary, especially when it happened on, on a somewhat windy road with oncoming traffic at one point. Well, I took it to my local dealership, which at the time was in Northern Virginia, and the technician that was there uh, was able to fix it pretty quickly. And there's a whole story behind that, which you can check out on Red Pants, but basically it was a broken fuel vapor recirculation hose. Uh, he ended up fixing it in less than an hour, start to finish. Everything's been right as rain since then. One of the stranger things that happened to me was when I was driving along one day and my fuel gauge went almost completely empty. And it was the middle of nowhere and I had like an eighth of a tank of gas. I had just filled up that morning so I knew I should have had gas. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I just dumped gas all over the ground. I've got an environmental issue. My buddy in his Ford GT behind me is gonna be covered in gasoline. This is all bad. So we pull over, everything's bone dried, nothing smells like fuel, we can't figure it out. Later that day, actually, I filled up and it only took a few gallons of gas. It took about what it should have. Obviously, it's a gauge issue. So I take it to the dealership and the technician looks at it and goes, oh yeah, I, I, I've seen this before. An hour later, he comes back out, car's completely done in an hour. And he says, it's the fuel center unit, clean it, adjust it, you're good to go. So if you notice that your fuel gauge just has a dead spot, whether it's a small spot where it sits like this and next thing you know, it does that real quick. Um, and it could be a small spot, it could be a big one. I had a huge one, it was like from almost full to almost empty was the dead spot. Um, that's the fuel center unit, it just needs to be adjusted. So it's sending the right signal um, to the gauge, to the fuel gauge to say how much fuel you actually have. Also in the fuel tank is the fuel pressure issue that I had about a year ago. Well, it started almost two years ago. Uh, it started off with the starter not working as well or taking longer to start the engine uh, at startup. And this was, uh, it started off very subtly, very subtly, and then slowly, slowly, slowly over the course of months, it got worse and worse. And uh, at one point I was in Texas, it was during my road trip across the United States, I replaced my starter. And in that I erroneously said that I think wrongly that the um, the headers, because I have aftermarket headers, they were not ceramic coated, they were not wrapped uh, with thermal wrap or anything, they were completely unshielded between the headers and the starter, that could have burnt up the starter. And I was wrong. I, we replaced the starter, it did help because it was a fresh starter, but the startup issue was still somewhat the same. Well, it turned out uh, I messaged a, you know, a master technician that I know and said, hey, here's what I've done to fix this issue, or to diagnose this issue. Um, replace the battery, replace the coil packs, replace the start, the spark plugs, clean the throttle body. Uh, I did, you know, checking ground points, all this stuff. And he goes, okay, well, your car, you know, how many miles does your car have? And I told him it was like 90,000 miles, started, you know, 10,000 miles ago, or whatever it was. And he said, okay, well, do diagnostic on the fuel system. You'll want to check fuel pressure at startup, and when the engine's cut off, you'll want to make sure that it holds fuel pressure. It should hold fuel pressure without losing more than one PSI over the course of 24 hours. 
for that first 24 hours and said, okay. So I did that. Um, the trick is you have to have an OBD2 reader that can read when the car is off. Uh, the reason being that when you cut the engine for a lot of OBD2 readers, they might not hold that signal and they'll turn off as well. So keep that in mind. But uh, it was very 10 second diagnosis because we turn on the engine and there's just no fuel pressure. And then when we turned off the engine, what, when it finally built up fuel pressure, we turned off the engine and the fuel pressure just went almost all the way to zero, like to nothing. Uh, it was obviously exactly what the master technician had said, which was the uh, fuel pressure was not being held. Um, he said that the main culprit is a check valve that's in one of the lines. So we took a look at that, turned out you know, it, it was not holding any pressure. So we were able to diagnose that really quick when we pulled that line out of the uh, fuel tank. Um, he also said that for a lot of these cars, he starts noticing issues starting at about 100,000 miles. If not that check valve, the fuel pump or both uh, will start to fail. So over 100,000 miles, it becomes an issue. I had it much earlier on, but it was an easy fix. What I would consider to be my biggest issue with reliability is also the one that I care least about, and that is the front timing cover gasket of the 4.3 liter engine in my car. Now the reason why it's kind of a big issue is because the cost of repairing it is very expensive. The right way to do it is to replace the gaskets between the timing chain cover and the engine itself. And those gaskets are not expensive, but the labor required to replace them is, because it takes a lot of work to get those gaskets changed out. However, for a lot of people, we simply don't really care. So it's a matter of whether or not you want your car to be absolutely pristine or not, and if that's because of your own taste or because you're preparing it for a buyer, there's a lot of variability there. So I'm not gonna comment on what's the best thing to do. It comes down to a case-by-case -case basis. For me, I'm not really worried about it. Uh, I do have the front timing cover chain front timing cover gasket leak, but it's not that bad. Uh, it's easy to find. You'll see a bit of oil that is underneath the engine. It's on the front leading edge of the engine where that timing cover gasket is. It's very easy to spot. It's gonna be some oil and a bit of grime built up from just whatever's kicked up from the road or whatever. If it's serious, you'll have a little bit of an oil leak. It'll be a couple drops of oil sitting on the floor of your garage when you move the car in and out, you'll see it. But even then, it's not that big of a deal because the amount of oil that it's gonna leak is next to nothing compared to how much of the oil the engine burns anyway, just naturally. So it's more of a little bit of an embarrassment than anything else. And for people that are more OCD, which I'm kind of on the verge of, uh, it does become more of an issue. But when it comes to the functionality and safety of the engine, it's actually not that big of a deal. Another thing that's engine related is the radiator, which I ended up blowing during a dyno session when I was trying to get dyno figures uh, for the supercharger kit. Um, that was also when I noticed that the fueling was the most likely issue of my startup problems because I was starting to see erratic fueling there uh, when we were doing the warm ups and everything. But the radiator cracked. That was due to age and abuse. Um, I have wrecked this car a number of times. So one of those involved the radiator fan shroud actually breaking. It cracked on one of the arms that holds the, one of the radiator fans in place. So no surprise whatsoever that the radiator also failed because it had taken a large portion of that shock as well. So no surprise there, um, but the radiator had to be replaced. Talking about exhaust systems isn't necessarily a reliability issue, but since this is directly related to age and condition, and we're doing a bunch of refresh on my car to prepare it so I can own it for another 10 years and 75,000 miles, it's worth noting that when you change out the exhaust, whether you're removing the exhaust because you're doing something like a clutch change, for example, or if you're modifying your exhaust by replacing your muffler or cats or headers or whatever, there's a lot of components that need to be taken into account. So anytime a gasket is removed from a car, it should be replaced. That just goes without saying. But it also comes down to fasteners because being able to reuse fasteners is nice because you unbolt something and you bolt it back up nice and easy. However, sometimes they may not be usable. So I noticed that on my car, for example, the hangers for the mid pipes were, uh, they use a rib nut that is attached to the top half of this hanger. And I've got pictures of this in, uh, if you go to Red Pants in the information section, there's a part for exhaust systems and it goes through all this in detail. But basically uh, the bushings on this car were completely shot for the uh, mid pipe hangers. They were so shot that I could just pick up the hanger and remove it without even thinking, it was just set there. They weren't holding it at all. So those had to be replaced. Uh, the bushings for the mid pipe hangers had to be replaced. The hanger itself had to be replaced because the rib nuts, two of those had broken off. 
And when that's the case, it's you just can't reuse that uh, unless you use a washer, some yeah, nut and wa bolt and washer and all that. You can make it work, but it's not ideal. So I'm replacing that as well. The bolts for that hanger were also shot and their Torx bolts, they were really, really nasty. So I had to get some new ones of those. Uh, two of the four spring bolts, the springs were fine, but the bolts themselves broke. So I had to replace the bolts, uh, replace all four because none of those were usable, let alone the two that broke. Um, and then also the clamps between the muffler and the tailpipes were so corroded that uh, we had to use a cutting wheel to cut the bolt at the halfway point so that that clamp could be opened up. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Again, it's not really a reliability thing, but it is kind of directly related to this whole topic. Another really interesting one that happened was when I broke a shift cable loose. Basically, I was on a rally and I overzealously shifted and it popped a shift cable loose. Uh, the transmission was stuck in neutral. I couldn't do anything about it. I had a AAA tow truck lift the front of, or excuse me, yeah, lift the front of my car so that I could get underneath and hug the transmission, which was super hot, on these and these hot exhaust pipes on this hot pavement. It was like 90 something degrees out uh, Fahrenheit. And I was able to feel around, which everything was hot. So I was just burning my hands and arms, but I was able to get my hands on that shifter cable, reconnect it. We dropped the car back. We drove it back and forth to make sure it could shift just fine. And the tow truck driver just says, I ain't never seen some shit like that. And that was the end. Went on the rally and it was totally fine. But that is something that can happen is the shifter cables can pop loose. And that did happen. That was the first time. And it happened again later on. The second time, I wasn't doing anything crazy. It just happened to be just... I guess things just lined up wrong and the shifter cable popped off. Um, I was able to get it into fourth gear, uh, luckily between the supercharger and the, the GMR supercharger and the Velocity AP uh, clutch package. I was able to find fourth gear and then go from a dead stop to my house over the course of several miles in only fourth gear, which Still, I'm impressed that was able to happen. But what I ended up doing the next day was I took a couple of zip ties, I did one around the shift cable and one around the bell crank lever, and then uh, linked them to create a basically a, a connection, a chain link connection between the two. And it's a little bit janky, but I had some zip ties and I was like, screw it, I'm gonna see if this works. Um, you don't want them so tight that they can't move because the, both of those things have to move. The, bro, the bell crank lever and the shifter cable both have to move. So you want them to be loose. All you wanna do is connect them so that those, are, those zip ties don't allow the shifter cable to come free of the bell crank lever, that's it. Um, I thought it was a bit janky until uh, sometime later I was going through some service bulletins and I found Aston Martin's own way to do that is exactly the same. They just use safety wire because that's the better way to do it, but they do the same thing. You use safety wire to link the two exactly the same way as I had done. At one point I was having this weird starting issue where uh, the car would either start perfectly or it would not start at all. There was no different, there's no in between, it was on off, it was binary. And it turned out that um, when I pulled open the parcel shelf and I, to see the battery, I found the problem immediately. And that was that the stud on the chassis where the ground cable for the battery bolts onto had broken clean loose. No idea how, no idea why it would happen, but it was just the ground cable, the battery was just hanging limp with the stud attached to the end, but not connected to anything. Uh, so when it turned out that whenever I would start the car, if that limp ground cable and stud were resting against the chassis, it would create that ground, battery would be fine, and it would start up the engine. But if that was hanging in a way where it wasn't grounding on the chassis, then the car wouldn't start, it would be nothing. There would be absolutely zero response as if there was no battery at all. So 
not a hard fix, just you know, undo the you know the 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 old stud and then attach the ground cable to another stud because there's you know another one nearby that I could fix onto. But it's a really weird thing. So if you find yourself in that situation, take a look and make sure that the stud on the chassis where the the main battery ground cable is, make sure it's not broken because that can somehow happen. At least it happened to me. The ambient air temperature sensor or outside air temperature sensor sits behind the grill of the car in the very front and it's what tells the car how hot or cold it is outside. The problem is if they go bad and they can, it will send a signal that is not accurate to the actual temperature outside. And if this temperature is extreme enough, it will trigger a fail safe in the car. So um, if you notice that your temperature for your outside air temperature reading is way off. So let's say it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but it's reading 130. You know it's not 130 degrees Fahrenheit outside, otherwise you'd probably be on the news. It's a faulty air temperature sensor, the ambient air temperature sensor, and you will want to fix it. Although I have not had any issues with my headlights, I have had the dreaded taillight condensation. Um, the taillights that are on there are a, the clear ones. Uh, I had one go bad fairly early on and another one a couple years later. So uh, just because uh, the taillights are either made at the same time or supplied at the same time or whatever, uh, they can go bad at different rates. So I've had um, condensation in both of my taillights. I've got repair kits and DIYs and stuff like that. So make sure you check out Red Bands for those. A fairly common issue that some of us have dealt with, including me on both of my V advantages, is the fuel for the lid not opening when you press the release button inside the cabin. There is a white manual release that's against the solenoid inside the trunk of the car, inside that little cubby next to the fuel lid. Um, so if that doesn't work, you can use a, a credit card and just put that in there. And while you're trying to release it, you get the credit card up and under. But basically, uh, there's a few different things that can happen there. One is the solenoid needs to be replaced or at least maintained a bit. Uh, I was able to spray some lubricant into mine and get it to free up. It works a lot better after that. Uh, another issue is that it could be the lid is misaligned, which you can loosen some of the bolts uh, that hold the lid in place and just slightly adjust those to make it align better. I have had a faulty windshield washer reservoir. It's not uncommon for those to crack. No idea why. I've talked to a few people at Aston Martin. They don't know why either. Uh, repairs can work temporarily, but generally they don't hold up over time. Um, they're just one of those weird things. For some reason, the, the washer reservoir just cracks and it's easy to figure out because if you pour a bunch of water into the filler neck and then it's a puddle under your car, you know you have that. Um, it also reminds you because depending on where that crack is, the level may get too low and it'll send off, it'll trigger that sensor that says, you know, fill up your washer reservoir. But that is something I've had on this car. So those are the issues I've had with my 2007 V8 Vantage after 10 years and 75,000 very abusive miles. Now, of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Some of the things that happened on this car did not happen. Actually, the vast majority did not happen to my red car, but I did have a couple issues with my red V8 Vantage, same year, same everything, um, that didn't happen to this one. So for example, on that one, the fuel cap actually broke apart. Uh, and I'll put a picture up of it so you can see what that looks like, but it actually broke apart completely to be completely unusable. Um, that's not unheard of. It's rare, I think, because I haven't heard too many people say that it happened to them, but I have heard it, people say it happened to them. So keep that in mind. I also haven't had any of the leather pulling issues on the interior trim panels in this car as have happened to a lot of other Aston Martins. It's extremely common in these cars is the leather on the dashboard especially will pull. Uh, I haven't had it in this car, knock on wood. Um, so that's been fine. My red car, I did have that. Uh, it was like that when I bought it though, but that was a problem with that car. I also haven't had any of the issues with the ski slope aside from that broken hinge point for the nav lid, um, which I talked about before, but that's just because I've taken this thing apart so many times, it was bound to happen sooner or later. But for the red car, it had a piano black ski slope and that was cracked pretty badly. 
Something else that I've seen on people's cars that I've worked on is the LCD screens, uh, either the gauge cluster where the little LCD readout is for the, di the digital display for your miles per hour, uh, your speed, for example, um, and also the radio display where it says, you know, the, the temperatures and the radio station, all that. Uh, those can have this weird effect where it looks like somebody pushed their thumb into it and created a spot in the middle. And it makes it hard to read and it's very annoying. Um, though I've seen that on a number of cars. I haven't had it with either of mine. Neither of my cars had any issues with the grill. Uh, the slatted grill, so the six bar and the eight bar grills can come loose. The slats or the support, the vertical supports behind them can come loose and go missing. Uh, it's not terribly uncommon. It does happen. Uh, that's something I haven't had to do with myself. I do have some supports that are being made right now. If they aren't already on the Red Pants online store, they will be soon, uh, but those can get loose and go missing. So you'll wanna check those. Uh, the easy solution to that, although it is somewhat permanent, is just to put a tiny dab of super glue on each of the connections for the slats and supports so that it can't fall apart. And of course, since both of my cars are coupes, I haven't had any convertible roof related issues. So either a faulty convertible roof module or CRM, which is not uncommon, uh, or anything to do with the hydraulics or the roof inoperability issues. Obviously hadn't had those because I have got coupes. So that's something else to keep in mind. So that's pretty much it. That is the list of things I've had happen with this particular car after 10 years of ownership and 75,000 some odd miles of very abusive driving. Uh, that includes a lot of track days at multiple tracks around the United States, uh, driving through everything from ice storms and flooded areas to the desert um, and stop and go traffic in congested metro areas and everything else. Uh, it's been through a lot. And so I think for as far as reliability is concerned, there's not really been any showstoppers and there's nothing that really concerns me about the car. I still have no qualms with driving it back and forth across the country over and over again. Um, obviously this is not an exhaustive list. Obviously there's other things that can and will happen out there, but for me, this is kind of the extent of it. So. If you want to have a lot more information at your disposal, check out redpants.lol. I have a ton of information on there, including the content from my YouTube channel that is both written and displayed because I embed the videos from YouTube into those articles and pages. So make sure you check out redpants.lol. And of course, this is all paid for by the Red Pants online store. That's how I pay my bills, that's how I make my money, and that's how I survive. So if you want to show some support, if you like what you see, check out the online store, and please do consider buying from me if you need any of the parts I sell. If not, I also have a support page if you're feeling generous or drunk enough to make a donation. Both of those things has happened, and I thank all of you guys for that, <laughs> especially for some of those notes. Um, but that's the video, hope you like it. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, cuddle, whatever, and I'll see you in the next video.